So we're on uh, uh, page 119, the paragraph 30.5. These are the quotes uh, from sacred scripture indicating the indefectibility of the church. And he gave him power and glory and a kingdom and all peoples, tribes and tongues shall serve him. His power is an everlasting power that shall not, God bless you, that shall not be taken away and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. So that is the perpetuity of the church as an institution. But in the days of those kingdoms, uh, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed and his kingdom shall not be delivered up to another people and it shall break uh, in pieces and shall consume all these kingdoms and itself shall stand forever. Daniel, okay. Isa uh, also Isaiah, which, uh, which St. Augustine and St. Thomas explained must be understood concerning the church. All right, so, uh, but that central kingdom is the true church of Christ, ergo proof of the minor. So he's, he's concentrating here on the perpetuity of the church as an institution. There is no other kingdom of the Messiah indicated taking the place of the synagogue than the Christian religion, which Christ established in the form of the church. The church in the New Testament is called the kingdom of Christ. Three, the meaning of the prophecies in the New Testament is lucidly explained. For the angel sent to Mary said concerning Emmanuel, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of David his father, and he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. St. Paul comparing the Old Testament to the New as something mobile to something immobile teaches this, therefore receiving an immovable kingdom, we have grace. All right, so that's why, again, you have to have some explanation for continuity of institution in your theology of the present day. Right. So you can't just... Uh, the, the, there are essentially two lineages. The, the lineage, you might say, of the soul of the church and the lineage of the body of the church. See, this is everything that pertains to the mission of the church. This is everything that pertains to the institution of the church. Both of those lineages must survive. And whatever explanation you give must address those two lineages. And preserve them. The promises of Christ, the church is built upon a rock. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ himself is with the church until the end of the world. The paraclete remains with it forever. But by all these, indefectibility is clearly promised absolutely. And certainly that a building built upon a rock is firm and immovable is illustrated with the words which, with, with, words with the metaphor of a rock. Everyone, therefore, that heareth these my words and doth them shall be likened to a wise man that built his house upon a rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded on a rock. Whatever should intrude into it, even if the gates of hell should break forth, the church will emerge victorious all the way until the end of the world forever. The promise of Christ is absolute. The fact that our Lord said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it implies that there is going to be a, a very, very uh, good uh, or powerful uh, assault on it by the devil. In other words, uh, the, that word prevail, because it sounds like a big battle. He didn't say, well, don't worry, n nothing will ever try to overthrow the church. 
He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The parables and institutions of Christ on earth, there will never be a time in which there are no faithful, no ministers, no sacraments. Therefore, the church is indefectible. Proof of the antecedent that the faith will, will always be there is taught to us by the parable of the wheat and cockle and of the net. For we read, even as the cockle, therefore, is gathered up and burnt with fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all scandals and them that work iniquity. We know who they are. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. That there will always be ministers is taught by St. Paul, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and others some evangelists and others some pastors and doctors for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all meet in the unity, into the unity of faith and of knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ. I don't know why that I don't have a reference there. <clears throat> By these words, the time of harvest and the resurrection of the saints is indicated. Three, St. Paul, that should be uh, number two. St. Paul declares that the sacraments are instituted perpetually, for as often as you shall eat this bread and drink the chalice, you shall show the death of the Lord until he come. That S-H-E-W is the archaic spelling of show. In the, from the Douay Reims. St. Thomas says that the words donek veniat refer to his last coming, in which it is given to understand that this rite of the church will not cease until the end of the world. Argument two from the testimony of the fathers. St. Ignatius of Antioch, the disciple of St. John, the apostle said, because of it the Lord received in his head an anointing Because of it, the Lord received in his head an anointing in order that he breathe incorruption into the church. With these words, at least implicitly, is the indefectibility of the church designated. St. Justin, just like a vine, if someone should cut off those parts which bear fruit, it benefits in such a way that the other branches flower again and bear fruit. So it happens with us. The vine planted by God and our Savior Christ is his people. Okay, St. John Chrysostom, the church is stronger than the sky. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Which words? Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now how the Greek schismatics could read that and not understand, you know, he's placing all of the indefectibility of the church in the Sea of Peter. St. Augustine speaks about the church in this way, for how long will I be in this world? Tell me because of those who say, he was and is no more. And he told me, and this voice was not in vain. Who told me except the way? How did he tell me? Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. Argument three, from the origin, end, and history of the church. There is no one who does not see how incongruous it would be that the church should perish, which God gave, uh, gave to us in his Son, whom he constituted as the heir of all things, through whom he made heaven and earth. So, you know, that it would just somehow go out of existence doesn't make any sense at all. Christ instituted the church in order that men through it receive the means of salvation. So that means if it ceased to exist, many people would not have the means of salvation. But men would not, never, be in, in, uh, never be not in need of these means. From this, one understands that the perpetual survival of the church is something which is demanded by the order of salvation established by God. 
And three, it is proven by historical faith that the church has undergone persecutions. But so many victories achieved manifest uh, that it Oh, okay, uh, but so many, uh, so the fact that so many victories were achieved, it doesn't read right, manifest the hand of God and promise it in the future. So as I said, I mean, it, with all of the human failures in the church in its history and also all of the assaults on the church from without, and from within, uh, it, it never should have survived without, unless it had the help of God. Even many non-Catholics have recognized the unconquered kingdom of the church. Objections. The promises which were made to the Jewish church are not more obscure than those made to the Christian church. But the Jewish church defected Therefore, it is uncertain that the church will never defect. This is, uh, the SSPX brings this up. The, the Old Testament was not uh, infallible. You know, they, 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 uh, therefore the New Testament is not, you know, something along those lines. I've seen that. You know, that they taught error and they, they you know, defected in various ways. Jewish people. Response, I distinguish the major. The promises made to the Jewish church were to be continued and fulfilled under the New Testament. I concede in the old law, I deny. I distinguish the minor. The Jewish church defected in figure, I concede. In the figured thing, I deny. You see, the figured thing was the... the Messiah and the church. There was, there was a, a shadow or a, for uh, a symbol and sign of the future church. So. Indeed, the Jew Jewish religion is said by St. Paul as having a shadow of the good things to come, not the very image of the things. For this reason, St. Augustine said, this very priesthood after the order of Aaron was appointed as the shadow of a future eternal priesthood. And therefore, when eternity is promised to it, it is not promised to the mere shadow and figure, but to what is shadowed forth and prefigured by it. But lest it should be thought that the shadow itself was to remain, therefore its mutation also behooved to be foretold. Instance, before Christ was born, the Judaic church defected, for example, at the time of the captivity. Therefore, despite the promises, the church is able to perish. Response, I distinguish the antecedent. The Judaic church, before Christ was born, had defected in many members, I concede. In all, I deny. For at no time were there lacking those who were persevering in the true way of worshiping God. Like St. Joseph, like... Uh, Zachary, all of those uh, pious Jews. Uh, <clears throat> however, the Judaic church was able to be obscured much more than the Christian church, A, because it was particular and not universal, B, it lacked the abundance of the graces given to the church, C, because God himself had predicted in 3 Kings 9, 7, I will take away Israel from the face of the land which I have given them, and the temple which I have sanctified to my name, I will cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. For this reason, he at times struck the Judaic church in such a way that it seemed to be almost entirely destroyed. Yes? Well, these refer to the Old Testament. You know, so I, I don't think the, there is any direct reference to the New Testament. But you can see parallels. In other words, you can see that you know, at least some people survived 
this general defection in the Old Testament. And, and uh, that uh, despite the Pharisees and all of the infidelity of the Jews at the time of Christ, there were some pious Jews. So I think there's a parallel there, but I don't think you could say these texts refer directly to what we're living through now. Instance concerning the end of the world, we read in Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Likewise in Luke 18, 8, I say to you that he will quickly revenge them, but yet the Son of Man, when he cometh, shall he find, think you, faith on earth. And all the commentators answer that by no. All right. so the, 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 the obvious implication of Christ is in the negative, that the number of faithful will be reduced to a very small number, almost insignificant. Yes? Luke, yes. Luke, yes. At the end of the world, there'll be virtually no one with the faith. That, that's the way in which it is taken. So the human race is not going to finish well. It's going to finish really badly. Okay. <laughs> and the, the false Christ and the false prophets, that, that already happened after our Lord shortly after our Lord. Yes, there were false Christs and false prophets in the period between his ascension and the destruction of Jerusalem. Yes. Well, Christ, uh, you know, the anointed one is. Uh, so I think it would be people who are claiming to be the Messiah. So. False prophets. I think you could easily apply that to. Uh, Novus Ordo hierarchy, <laughs> you know, people uh, claiming to represent the church and teaching false doctrine. I think you could easily apply that. But you see, in that text of Matthew, you see, the, the, if the, the, I gave a whole sermon on this. If you look at all, th I think there's three, there's Luke and Matthew where he, they are parallel. The apostles come to him and, and they're, they ask him two questions. One is, what are the signs of the destruction of Jerusalem and what are the signs of the last days? And Cardinal Bio analyzes it very well. He says, our Lord makes a distinction in those responses between these days and those days. See, so there were two questions to our Lord, and the two are related because the destruction of Jerusalem was a, a prefiguration of the end of the world. See, so they were related, and that's why there is sometimes he's referring to the the period before the destruction of Jerusalem, sometimes he was referring to the period before the end of the world in that response. And Matthew tends to mix it up a little bit. But they are, one is the symbol of the other. But the, there's a clear designation between these days and those days. Cardinal Bio pointed that out. These days referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, those days referring to the end of the world. I gave a sermon on it. Probably, maybe I should give another one. Um, probably not recorded or something. St. Paul teaches that the day of the Lord is not imminent unless there come a revolt first. See, the, the Thessalonians were saying we're going, the end of the world is you know, around the corner. 
And he wrote them that second epistle saying, no, there's certain things that have to happen first. And one of them is this revolt. And that is taken to be the great apostasy from the faith. Actually, it's apostasia in, in Greek. See, so the uh, so all the commentators, including the Catechism of the Council of Trent, call it the great apostasy from the faith. I, I don't think there's any doubt but that we're in it. <laughs> this isn't it. I, I would hate to see the, the big one. <laughs> okay, so that's, and it's one of the three things that are required by the Catechism of the Council of Trent before the coming of the anti, uh, before the coming of the end of the world, and that is the preaching of the gospel to the whole world, which was not true in 1570, but is true now. Two is the great apostasy from the faith. Which was not true in 1570, but is true now. And number three is the Antichrist, which may not be too far off. <laughs> when those three things uh, are done, those are three things that must happen before the end of the world, according to the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Yes? Not necessarily, but those, those three things, all they're saying is those three things must happen before the end of the world. So number one and number two we can check off. Yes? St. Paul uh, speaks about that very clearly in Romans 11. So, yes, that has to happen, but they just didn't mention it. But uh, the Cardinal Bio says, you're going to see the conversion of the Jews at the end of this great apostasy. And they will bring a time of, he says, a time of flourishing of the Catholic Church that it has never seen in its history. That's what he says. I agree with him. Convert the Jews, it'll solve everything. As I said, they'll buy St. Peter's Basilica. <laughs> Jews make the best converts. They... You, you see the, in them, I mean, despite all of their machinations against the Catholic Church over the, the centuries, you see in them a certain gift that God has given them for accomplishing their goals. The children of this world are, are wiser in their own generation than the children of light, as our Lord said. In other words, the, those who do evil things and are worldly, are wiser and more efficacious in the pursuit of their goals than the good are in the pursuit of heaven. But all that energy and ability, if it's turned toward the Catholic faith, as I said, we don't have to worry, just sit back, I'm gonna retire. They'll just take care of everything. I, I do think that. They are not a people of half measures. It either is or it isn't, <laughs> at least in my experience with them. So, so the church, therefore, because in the end it, w it will defect and is not indefectible, that's the objection because there's going to be a great apostasy. So in response, I distinguish the antecedent. By these testimonies, there is predicted a very great persecution of the church. I concede the destruction of the church. I deny. I will respond to each of the allegations. Many will be drawn into error by marvels of the false Christs. I concede the universal church. I deny. 
The words of Christ that have been cited were said by way of a certain exaggeration, but the elect, as if the text itself shows, will not defect. And don't think that that means Christ said something false. Hyperbole is a, is a figure of speech. So it's, it's a legitimate figure of speech, and it's occasionally used in, in sacred scripture. So, but that's his, his, you know. Um, so it, will he find faith on the face of the earth? If you take that in, in its extreme, it means no one will have the faith. And he's certainly not saying that. But it's, it's virtually no one will have the faith. Concerning what is objective from St. Luke, I distinguish these things pertain to perfect faith I concede, to faith simpliciter I deny. St. Bede the Venerable said, So great will be the rarity of the elect, that not so much because of the clamor of the faithful, but more by the lukewarmness of the others, will the ruin of the whole world be accelerated. These things must be understood, however, in relation to perfect faith and not absolutely, since St. Augustine said, He, however, who should have the faith like the mustard seed, by which also the mountains are moved, are indeed very rare. Concerning such a faith, the Lord said, But yet the Son of Man, when he cometh, shall he find, thank you, faith on earth. And so he, he's saying that that perfect and absolutely fervent faith is going to be very rare, but there will still be many that will have a, a I might say, a, a more, how would you say, a less strong faith. That's St. Augustine. But, I mean, that's just an interpretation. You know, it's, it, it may be true or false, I don't know. Concerning such, okay, that's right. The revolt or apostasy which St. Paul predicts is the apostasy of everyone I deny, of many I concede. St. Thomas says, it would happen that the faith be received by the whole world, and after this, many will defect from the faith, which is exactly what happened. The charity of many shall grow cold. Yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's disputed whether the Antichrist will be at the end of the world or that not before the end of the world. In other words, that's disputed by commentators. Yes? Concerning Cardinal Pio, he said that there would be a flourishing of the church, but then the Antichrist... No. You have great apostasy, Antichrist, then the flourishing of the church, then the end of the world. Because he says that the... Revolution, although it will be chained up, will not be destroyed. Meaning every revolution, all modern, sick, you know, woke, let's call it, <laughs> is that it will be uh, chained up but not destroyed and that it will present itself again and that the, the, the state of the world at the end of the world will be actually worse than it ever was. That's what he says. I translated it. I think it's in one of the Sacerdotiums. I'm going to read it. It's very interesting. He, it's based on the seven ages of the church. The seven letters to the seven bishops, or the seven angels, in the second chapter of the Apocalypse. Those are considered the seven ages of the church, and it's very interesting because he goes through each of the ages and shows how this age is. is uh, this is, according to him, the age of Sardis. Sardis was a city in the ancient world which was known for money and he said this age now he's writing well the the it was printed in 19 around 1920 but he may have written because that might be a, a later edition but he was writing toward that uh, he was active under Pius X as a matter of fact he uh, submitted one of the drafts for Pascendi uh, he was a highly respected theologian and very anti-liberal, extremely anti-liberal, <laughs> an anti-modernist. I mean, uh, yeah. so the uh, uh, 
he uh, said that we're in the period of Sardis, which he said will go, which goes from the French Revolution to the conversion of the Jews. To the, uh, yes, conversion of the Jews. And in that, at the end of Sardis, you're going to see the Antichrist. And he says this period will be characterized by extreme wealth, like the world has never seen before, which is true. And secondly, that, the, uh, that there will be a great apostasy from the faith and that the thing to do is to cling to the traditions no matter what. That's what he says. Isn't it? I'll bring it in if you want. It's, it's chilling when you read it. I mean, when he was writing in a time when the church was, <laughs> was flourishing a great deal. I mean, it was always persecuted by those horrible governments in Europe. But still, it was flourishing despite that. Yes? So in that system between the flourishing of the church and think ye that you shall find faith on earth, there would have to be some great defection. Yes, according to him, Sardis will, after Sardis is done, you will have Philadelphia. Nothing to do with the city of Philadelphia. But it is, well, it is the ancient city of Philadelphia, which means the city of brotherly love. And he says that is indicative of the, uh, this period of the flourishing of the Catholic Church. And then the last period is Laodi, Laodicea. Ah. That comes from the Greek, laos means people, and dike means judgment. So he says this is the judgment of the people, indicating the last judgment. I know everybody gets all worked up about it. <laughs> it's an interesting theory. You know, it's a theory, but an awful lot of it makes sense because he goes through the various ages and shows the very things that the angel complains about in each age. And he assigns the times of each age. Yes? <laughs> well, we won't be in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, no, Allentown, and somehow that didn't make it into the apocalypse. <laughs> yes? In his... Uh, in the addendum or the uh, appendix of the, his De Ecclesia. It's all in Latin, of course. Uh, but I translated it. It's in uh, Sacerdotium, but I have to find it for you. Um, and uh, God bless you. And um, um, it's interesting. It, it's, it's tantalizing, you might say. To, uh, uh, the fact that he predicts the great apostasy now and he says hold on to the traditions is the most chilling thing in it no one would have thought of that i mean you know, i grew up in my extreme youth under Pius the 12th if somebody said you know you're going to see this this complete destruction of catholicism in your own lifetime i know my parents would have said oh, oh that's ridiculous you're crazy you know it, 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 the church was so powerful at that point and in such good condition, no one would have ever, ever believed that. So, I mean, it, for him to write that in yet a, a, a better time of the church, I mean, the missionary activity of the church was just on fire when he, you know, the... the, the and Pius X had suppressed modernism, and you know, I mean, it was the church was strong you know, when he was writing those words. So that is a, a very, very insightful prediction. <laughs> this is the most interesting part of the Ecclesia. <laughs> so. Uh, so, objection two, the church has defected, therefore it is able to defect. Proof of the antecedent. The church defected when at the death of Christ the Old Testament ceased to be, and at the same time the disciples were vacillating with Peter. You see, so some say that only the Blessed Virgin Mary still retained the faith, and I 
I'm almost certain that was condemned by the church. Dom Guéranger said it, but it was later reproved in some way by the church. B, when the Arian heresy arose, St. Jerome is witness to the fact that the church defected. He said the whole world trembled and was shocked to find itself Arian. That's a, a hyperbole on the part of St. Jerome. Virtually everybody was Arian. That's what Response, I deny the antecedent, I respond to the proof. The church defected at the death of Christ. That is, some members of the church, I concede, the whole church, I deny. There was some weakness of faith which had been predicted by the Savior to the apostles. So, yes, they were weak in it. Then Jesus said to them, all you shall be scandalized in me this night. But it is not established by any suitable argument that everyone, whether apostles or disciples, lost the faith. See, it's one thing to be weak in the faith. It's another thing to lose the faith, just to say, well, I don't think Christ is God. They never said there's no evidence of that. Furthermore, on the third day after the death of Christ, the words of Christ, ego confirmavi columnas eius, I have strengthened their columns, had not yet been fulfilled, because that's the Holy Ghost. Likewise, after Peter and the rest of the apostles had been definitively constituted as pastors of the church, they never defected in the profession of the faith. They all died, except St. John, but he was lowered into boiling oil. So he had a, a virtual martyrdom. For a greater reason, once they received the spirit of truth, they were not able to fall into a false doctrine of faith. In what concerns the admiration of the world that it finds itself Arian, I distinguish. It was in admiration that it was accused of adhering to the Arian heresy, I concede, that, in, that it was in fact Arian, I deny. In the year 359, the Catholic bishops congregated at Rimini imprudently subscribed to a formula which, in which the word homoousios, consubstantial, was not found. So they said homoousios. Similar essence, not homoousios, which means the same. They were hoping that the Arians who were simulating the Catholic faith would join up with them if this word were passed over. See, that's always a bad move. All right. A little ecumenism. Now, those are bishops. Right. Bishops can make even congregated if every bishop in the world were congregated. They can make some real big boo boos. <laughs> right. They they have no guarantee of infallibility. Yes. It means, well, it means a whole bunch of things. Uh, it, the, uh, it, it is originally from the Black Death that if you had these marks on you, they were called boo-boos. And so fundamentally, it means some sort of, uh, like if a, a child gets a, a cut or something, he says, I have a boo-boo. Uh, but it also means a mistake. Right? So any kind of deviation or mistake, it's a boo-boo. <laughs> So, you know, that you had all those bishops at Vatican II approving all of that does not really affect anything. They've done worse. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say they've done worse, but they're capable of deviating. So, so that's really not an argument. The whole argument is the Pope. Paul VI promulgation of it. That's the big boo-boo. <laughs> And that is proof positive that, for whatever reason, he did not have the pontifical authority. So, but the Arians contended that the faith of Nicaea was overthrown by omitting this word. The whole world groaned, as St. Jerome said, and was shocked to find itself Arian. 
This same most holy doctor, however, explains these hyperbolic words as meaning an accusation of Arianism, adding this, the bishops who had been caught in the snare at Ariminium, that's Rimini, and had unwittingly come to be reported of as heretics, began to assemble while they called the body of our Lord and all that is holy in the church to witness that they had not a suspicion of anything faulty in their own faith. We thought that they, we thought, said they, the words were to be taken in their natural meaning, and we had no suspicion that in the church of God, the very home of simplicity and sincerity in the confession of truth, one thing could be kept secret in the heart and another uttered by the lips, which the Arians did. We thought too well of bad men and were deceived. See, so the bishops excuse themselves in that way that we thought we were doing the right thing. We thought that the words were equivalent and that this would placate the Arians. There's a saying in Florida, don't throw chickens to hungry alligators because they just come back for more. Meaning, don't try to placate heretics because they're just going to come back at you and ask for the complete devouring of your religion. That's the dialogue against the Luciferians. <laughs> that needs some explanation. There was a, uh, a bishop of Cagliari, which is, uh, is that Sardinia or uh, Sardinia? Uh, by the name of Lucifer. Now, Lucifer means light bearer. So he was not a Satanist. That was not an uncommon name. It means light bearer, Lucifer. And, and that was given to the head of the, of the, the uh, angels because he was, by most commentaries, the most perfect of all of the angels. All right, so, but his, he was called Lucifer. When uh, the Arian heresy was, had been defeated, the uh, Pope admitted to communion and kept in their places bishops that had been Arians. And that really irritated this Lucifer who was sent into exile for being uh, orthodox meaning adhering to the Catholic faith, he was sent into exile. And so he went into schism over the fact that the Arian bishops were rehabilitated. And so that's why he says dialogue against the Luciferians. So he, that's what he's, St. Jerome is writing against them, this schism. The same thing happened in the French Revolution. Pius VII admitted to communion and to uh, to keeping their places, the uh, constitutional bishops, the bishops that had defected during the French Revolution and signed the constitution of the clergy and were schismatics. And when, when Napoleon came in, part of the concordat was that those bishops be held in their places. Well, the, the bishops that were cast off their thrones by the French Revolution and Napoleon, etc., cetera, uh, were outraged that you know, here we are living in England and in Germany and you know, these, these creeps are now in charge of our dioceses. We're the rightful, you know. And Pius VII essentially said to them, I understand, but this is for the good of the church and just please go along with it. Well, many did, but many did not. And then they founded something called the Petite Eglise, which was the little church which died out uh, uh, a little church, that is, a, a group of them got together and decided we're going to uh, do our own church in France. So, uh, so the same thing happened. Besides, the acts of Rimini were rescinded by Liberius, the Supreme Pontiff. Uh, 
Objection three, it is not contradictory that the church, with regard to the number of its members and many other things, is so severely divini diminished that no aspect of it is evident. It, but if this could ha should happen, the visible church ceases. So it is not contradictory to say that at least the visible church defects. Response, I distinguish the major. It can happen that the accidental appearance of the church be diminished, I concede. Essential, I deny. It is plainly apparent from what has been said concerning the marks and visibility of the church that catholicity as well as visibility cannot be taken away from the church. Nor can the visibility of the church be taken away even under the cruelty of persecutors. St. Augustine said this, Moreover, it behooved that this same vine should be pruned in accordance with the Lord's repeated predictions, and that the unfaithful twigs should be cut out of it, by which heresies and schisms were occasioned in various localities under the name of Christ, on the part of men who sought not his glory but their own, whose oppositions, however, also served more and more to discipline the church and to test and illustrate both its doctrine and its patience. Beautiful quote. Which is exactly what is happening today. The defection of the Novus Ordo is strengthening the faith of those who are resisting it. The, the, this, the state of Catholics who are resisting it is far better than the state of Catholics, say, under Pius XII. It's far stronger, far more pious, far more believing. Believe me, I'm old enough to know that. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's the, the good side of it, so to speak. All right, I think we'll quit there.